So now that we've gone over regular DPoS, I'd like to talk about Byzantine fault tolerant DPoS, as well as how we're reducing latency to half second blocks. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about reducing latency to half second blocks here first, and then I'll get into the BFT. So we've got nodes located around the globe. And if this is the US and this is China, uh, this round trip time could be 300 milliseconds. Uh, and then you throw in the size of the block and the bandwidth constraints over longer connections. Um, that's impacting the uh, latency. So when you've got block A and block B, uh, or rather that way, uh, the block produced by A has to be received by B before their time slot. If it's not received and validated by B in time, B is going to ignore it. And then you're going to get forking and loss of participation. The whole network starts to collapse. So in Steam and Bisher, it's, it's random. So sometimes we'll go this way, then we'll go this way. Uh, you, know, you just don't know which way you're going to be going in terms of that. So the entire system is designed around this uh, worst case 300 millisecond round trip. But that's assuming they're directly connected. Uh, if they're indirectly connected, you might have two hops and latencies add up. Because the latency includes both the network latency to get there, the processing time on the node, because nodes don't relay blocks that aren't valid, and then on to the next node. This is why Steam and BitShares have a three second block time. Because three seconds has produced a stable network that allows for all this propagation delays. Uh, you can tell by these times that it seems like half a second is probably impossible. How in the world can you do half a second when it takes half a second to go to China and back? <clears throat> well, first thing, uh, if you look at the clock, now you got one block every three seconds. Right? So node A produces a block at this time. They're including all the transactions it received over this window in time. So what we do is we say, well, what happens if we have A, 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 and A? Then we hand off, and now we have B, 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 and B. This is every 500 milliseconds. But there's absolutely zero latency here. So you're never going to miss any blocks uh, from here. Um, the handoff from here is the only time you actually have to worry about internet latency. Uh, what, what's the worst case that happens? Well, maybe this block and this block get orphaned, or maybe it's the other way, maybe one of these. You might lose a few blocks in the handoff. But you can adjust the ratio of blocks per node versus handoff frequency so that your total downtime is less. And even then, this downtime, time without any confirmation, is less than the three seconds that you have with Steven Bishop before you get your first confirmation. The other thing we do on EOS is we recognize that these block producers are generally going to be very well known, like exchanges, universities, maybe small governments, uh, elected individuals with high amounts of trust. So we don't really have to worry about them misbehaving overtly. Uh, and we know where they're located. We know who they are. So we can connect them with direct connections to each other. And pick the, the producers can coordinate amongst themselves to select the order that they go round robin, such that you have California, Virginia, Greenland, China, India, around the globe, where it's basically 80 milliseconds per hop, rather than 300 milliseconds, uh, which means that you have far fewer missed gaps in between here. Uh, so we're removing the random shuffle that you would see in Steam and BitShares. The purpose of the random shuffle was to prevent A, or block producer B from always skipping A, or, or vice versa kind of prevented one block producer from picking on another block producer. But here, it'd be very obvious. Uh, C goes down because this guy's always 
missing him. Well, there's going to be a dispute. We have a dispute resolution process. We could figure out who to blame. All the other peers will say, hey, I saw the block produce, but they didn't include it. What's going on? Uh, and then the voters can, can figure out how to resolve the issue. Um, so because these are well known, they're incentivized to cooperate or they're going to lose votes. If there's a lot of fighting, all right, we don't know who's at fault, we just vote them all out. Right? Uh, so we get this very, very uh, stable, low latency connection that still goes around the world and distributes it. So this is still censorship resistant because you still have 21 different jurisdictions, 21 different people that are subject to both votes and um, arbitration. Because someone who's overtly censoring legitimate transactions is actually violating their constitution. Um, yeah, we've heard recently about uh, transactions as proof of stake. Uh, we okay. mentioned TAPOS. Can you yep. describe that? Sure, I can. I can talk about that here. Um, transactions or proof of stake is literally every single transaction included in a block. So if you've got a block here, it's got all these transactions. These transactions have a hash that references a previous block. And those transactions can only be included in a blockchain that has the previous block, which means it can't be migrated to forks. It also means that every user is also indirectly confirming the blockchain. So you can take the stakes of all the users, and depending on how active they are, you have direct confirmation. Like block producers are kind of indirect confirmation. People vote for them, and then the block producers confirm. But when users are interacting, you know where all the users are. Every transaction is a vote in the consensus. The problem is it takes longer time frame because you can't get every user to vote every block. But you can get every user to participate maybe every day. On Steam, I think like 50% of the stake participates within 24 hours, which is far, far better confirmation uh, of the blockchain than anything you could get from bonding or betting or Casper-like protocols. Is this a big part of interoperability between blockchains? Uh, Tapos does not play a part in that. It's, it protects the user from having their transaction replayed on a different blockchain. Uh, it, uh, the user is basically saying, this is state of the world I saw when I signed this transaction. And if any of my assumptions are wrong, then I, I don't, this transaction is not valid. So if someone presented a false chain, and then I made a transaction based on that false chain, it couldn't be included in the real chain. It protects the user um, and just adds to the overall integrity with very, very little overhead. So Steam, BitShares, and EOS all support this pretty much the same way. So we talked about um, this is how we reduce block times to half a second. This is how we reduce latencies by controlling the order. And we did sacrifice some of the attack um, resistance measures of Steam and BitShares where we assume that maybe the block producers are a little bit more hostile than they are. But the reality of DPoS is uh, the harm that they can do is only censorship. They can't unilaterally change rules. Um, and any bad behavior is observable and there's means of resolving it. Uh, <clears throat> so in order to get the higher performance, which we think will benefit the end users more than the theoretical uh, situations where one block producer will pick on another block producer. Um, one of the main differences between proof of work and DPoS is DPoS incentivizes cooperation. All producers are paid the same thing regardless of uh, the transactions they include. So there's no saying, hey, I'm going to ignore your block so I can get this transaction with a high fee. Uh, there's, no, I'm going to produce more blocks so I can make more. They all get paid for producing a block, and there's no financial incentive to attempt to manipulate block production. And there's financial disincentive for, for bad actors because they get voted out. But even with this system in place, it still takes 45 seconds to get irreversible. Because I might have 12 blocks produced by A, but uh, I need to wait until I've got at least one block produced by two-thirds of the producers. And it still takes 45 seconds to get two-thirds of the producers. So, uh, what we do is a block is produced by A. 
And then as soon as all the other producers receive it, if it extends their blockchain, it basically it's a new high watermark in length for them, then you're going to get um, acts from B, C, D, E, and F uh, all immediately. All right, so A might produce uh, several blocks, and with a little bit of time delay, basically you've got your producers around the world. A produces a block, it propagates out to all of them. Once you got two-thirds back from all of them, it's irreversible. So you say, go to China and back. Right? Maybe that's one second, you've got irreversibility because that's the worst case. So with one second delay, we've got uh, irreversible uh, Byzantine fault tolerant uh, confirmation. Um, now, how do we know that it's Byzantine fault tolerant? Well, the rule is uh, no producer can produce a block at the same block number. I don't know if you can see that. So you've got the same number, and you've got the same time. So every block header, you've got its number and its time and the previous block. <laughs> and the, the producer who signs it, and um, you have that information there. So if a block producer only signs a block when they receive a new high water mark, that's going to be a sequence number. If they sign, in order to produce a fork, you ha they have to sign that two different blocks at that sequence number, which is proof of Byzantine behavior. So if you have a chain here. I'm going to erase this. I've got a chain, and A produces a block, and then B produces a block, and then C produces a block. If I want to create an alternative chain, well, I need to have another block produced by B and another block produced by C. Now I've got two chains of the same length, and in theory, uh, I guess produced by A and according to the last irreversible block rule. This might be one irreversible block, this might be another irreversible block, and now you've got Byzantine failure. But in order for this to happen, C had to sign two blocks with the same block number or the same timestamp. And A had to do it. And you had to have uh, at least two-thirds of the producers be Byzantine in order to create a alternative irreversible block and break Byzantine fault tolerant. And even if the only one is, you can detect Byzantine failure of a single node, um, which means that if you present that evidence, and all the evidence is two block headers signed by the same person with the same block number, or two block headers signed by the same person with the same time, because remember, we have the time slots, and it's exactly one producer who can produce a block at that time. Uh, and on all forks, there's only one producer who can produce a block at that time. So, uh, two block headers signed by the same, two different block headers signed by the same person at the same time or block number is proof of Byzantine failure. It requires two thirds of them to create an alternative, last irreversible block. Um, and you've got evidence. And when you submit that evidence, you can do all kinds of things to your smart contracts. Everything from automatically removing them from the producer set to seizing their bond if on their behavior or their state tokens. Um, and this is far, far, far better than the other Byzantine algorithms on the market because normally if you take something like Tinderman, um, Tinderman says you've got one block. This is the head block. Uh, it goes through some process, and then you get another block. And every single block is irreversible. And this process in the middle involves uh, communicating to all the parties uh, initial proposal. Then you have your pre-vote. Everyone says, this is what I think I saw. And then you have your follow-up commit vote. It's, this is what everyone told me they thought they saw. And then you finally get your commit. And this entire process takes two to three seconds on a good quality network uh, that's global. 
So a 10 minute blockchain will reach your reversibility, uh, but you'd only have one block every two to three seconds. Uh, and if one third of them fail, all block production stops. Uh, the blockchain is dead. Whereas DPoS, if all but one fail, the chain can continue until you elect to do, and then you can uh, continue operation. Um, furthermore, this entire system can fail if one third is Byzantine, whereas BFT DPoS requires two thirds to be Byzantine in order to actually reach a false irreversible consensus. Um, and then the metrics of determining who's at fault is a little bit more complicated here than it is on uh, DPoS. So there's a lot more communication, but all parties have to communicate with all parties, I think at least twice, maybe three times. Whereas DPoS, one person broadcasts it, everyone else responds, and, and you're done for confirmation, and you don't need to do all the other handshakes. So those things combined create Byzantine fault tolerant DPoS with you know, 500 millisecond block times, uh, irreversibility after maybe one second, and continuous operation as long as you have at least one honest node, and it requires two thirds failure instead of one third failure. Then, uh, as an end user or as a DAP developer, what does that mean for me? All right. So, uh, reducing the confirmation latency from 45 seconds to one second uh, dramatically improves communication between blockchains because one blockchain can't accept a message from another blockchain until it's irreversible. So instead of me sending that blockchain a message, it waiting 45 seconds, processing the message, then sending me a message, waiting 45 seconds, right, so now you're talking like a minute and a half round trip communication between blockchains. With this system in place, now you have one second, maybe two seconds round trip between blockchains, which is faster than three second confirmations on BitShares today, or Steam today. The other benefit you get as an end user is uh, from the time you take an action to you get your first confirmation, it could be less than, uh, on average, 250 milliseconds. You do it, it gets received and confirmed at the next 500 millisecond mark. Uh, you know with 99.9% .9 probability that it's going to be eventually irreversible in that very short time frame, which means all the interfaces can be a lot more responsive to the user. Because um, latency, uh, on Steam you can click upvote, it goes one, two, done. Now you click upvote, done. <laughs> so it will allow seamless user experiences. Mm -hmm.